Well, good morning. Today is Saturday, October 13th, 2018, and we are in the Com Community Media Center in Westminster, Maryland. And I am Elaine May Stem interviewing Mr. Bob Miller from Tony Town. And good morning, Bob. Good morning. Uh, can you tell me what service you went into and what year you did that? I was in the United States Navy. I went in in August of 1964 after graduating from Westminster High School and uh, spent uh, six years in the Navy. Uh, loved it. It was a family tradition. My dad was in the Navy in World War II. My older brother did a four-year stint in the Navy uh, prior to me. And it just, we had an uncle that did 38 years in the Navy. Very good. So it was just in, in the family. At that time, were you drafted or enlisted? No, I enlisted. In fact, I was uh, only 17 years of age. The Navy had a program called Kitty Cruise where you went in uh, at 17, your parents had to sign for you, but your enlistment, your, your regular enlistment was normally up the day before you turned 21. Uh, but I decided to go into the missile part of the Navy and extended my enlistment for the full six year term uh, in order to get some additional schooling. Now your boot camp and training, where was that at? Boot camp was Great Lakes Naval Training Center. Uh, first time I'd ever flown in my life. I, boarded a United Airline plane and in what was then Friendship Airport, now BWI of course, mm -hmm. flew into O'Hare and uh, was uh, taken to Great Lakes Naval Training Center and for the next 10 weeks life was never the same. Do you have any experiences at boot camp that you can recall that might be uh, worth mentioning? Well, I, I tell you the one thing that I learned very quickly in boot camp, even though I had some hints from my brother and father was that the main, main goal of boot camp is to strip away your individuality and teach you that very valuable lesson in the military of learning to react and act as a unit. In fact, when we, uh, when we were first taken in, we reissued clothes, they cut your hair, of course, uh, and it was, a <laughs> it was not a stylish cut, but it was down to the bare bone and uh, our boot camp commander told us they then take you to a, a drill hall, stand you on a rack of risers and take a group picture. And our boot camp company commander uh, joked with us and said, now we're gonna develop these pictures, send them home to your mama and see if she can pick you out of this lineup because you all look alike. You all look alike. <laughs> Now, was this, this was during the Vietnam conflict. Uh, did you have an opportunity to go to Vietnam? Did not uh, get orders to Vietnam. I went into, uh, as I said, the missile program. I was in the uh, guided missile radar uh, operator for the Tartar missile system, which was a uh, surface to air missile, uh, short range missile, and uh, went through all the schooling and training. Part of that was still done at Bainbridge, which was still an operating uh, school at that time. It's now been shut down since uh, here in Maryland. And uh, when I completed my training, I was uh, sent aboard the USS Columbus. It was a guided missile cruiser, CG-12. And I spent the next four years on the Columbus uh, until I was released from service. So we were in the Atlantic fleet. We were stationed in Norfolk. And uh, we carried an Admiral on board when we went to the Mediterranean and we became uh, cruiser destroyer flotilla six. We were in charge of the fl sixth fleet and we worked closely with other NATO forces. Spent a lot of time in Naples because that's where the NATO headquarters were and the Admiral would be in with various high level meetings. So I never got a chance to uh, get on orders to Vietnam. If they'd have been cut, I would have went. Uh, the closest we came to any kind of action, we set off the uh, coast between Egypt and Israel. They were still having their six and seven day wars at the time. And we would always be on station in case they escalated and we were there to help evacuate American citizens. Uh, we got, got a lot of active training by that. We were, tra tra uh, we were uh, using the radar system to track the jets from both Israel and Egypt. So there was some active training, but nobody was ever shooting at us. So what year did you get out and uh, what rank were you then? I was an E-5 Petty Officer, second class. I was discharged, uh, well, I was released uh, with an early out on May 1st, 1970, and my discharge was completed in August of 1970. Right. And at that time, did you go back home or what was? Uh... Came back home. 
Uh, it was a unique experience. I always tell people the Navy is the reason I'm married to the lady I'm married to. First cruise on the Columbus in 1966, I met her brother. We piled around the Mediterranean for eight or nine months. Uh, he was being transferred. I took him home because my parents met the ship. I met his mom, met his dad, met his little sister, fell in love, and by that Christmas of 67, we were engaged to be married. We got married April 25th, 1970. And I'm sure you met a lot of uh, Navy personnel, and do you keep a relationship with them and keep in touch with them, and how do you keep that uh, camaraderie? One of my closest friends ever. I'm fortunate to have a large uh, cadre of friends. But one of my closest friends was a young man named Barry Kreiner. I met him in 1967 when he came aboard the uh, USS Columbus. He lived in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. When we were in port and had liberty uh, over a weekend, we'd drive home together. We spent time at each other's house. Uh, uh, he had one son when uh, I first met him. Saw, I saw him through the birth of his second son, the death of his first wife the remarriage to his second wife. And we were friends for a full 50 years. We visited back and forth from Lancaster to Westminster, not that far a distance. And unfortunately, last year on the 8th of September, Barry lost his fight to cancer and it was a very, very sad day. Sure. Uh, I miss him dearly. I speak with his widow and his two sons regularly, but that ability to pick up the phone and call him whenever I needed to chat with him. It's just not there anymore. And it's, it's a big hurt. Uh -huh. And, and that's a uh, lot of the other shipmates I still see. In fact, uh, last week of September, just recently, uh, we had our Navy, our Columbus reunion in Norfolk, Virginia. And I get to see my shipmates and some of my friends at least once a year. And I talk to them on the phone more often than that. So we stay in touch because uh, as you well know from being in the Marine Corps, Lane, when you're with a group of people that your lives depend on each other on a day-by-day -day basis, it's a camaraderie that you, if no one's ever experienced it, you have a difficulty explaining it to them why that is so special in your life. And more importantly, it's a bond. It's a bond that you gain and you never lose. Exactly. And I'm sure you have a lot of photos that you took during your time that you always have to look at. Oh, yeah, I'm in the process right now uh, when I was in, the, the uh, media of choice was usually slides. Uh, you got your 35 millimeter film developed into slides. So I'm in the process of putting my slides in, in, a, in an order so that I can get them converted to CDs so that they're more easily visible to, uh, to my friends. And, and now my grandson. My grandson sees uh, some of the photos I have and things of that nature and asks a lot of questions. So it'll be great to get those slides on video to where he can see them. You definitely are a real military man. Now, what did you do when you got out of, this, out of the service? What kind of career did you get started in? Well, I eventually wound up as a banker. If somebody would have told me that when I got out of the Navy, I don't think I would have believed them. But I wound up spending almost 40 years as a banker. Now, the first job I had when I came out of the Navy, it was 1970, and jobs weren't real plentiful. And I wound up with a, uh, I worked for the Singer Sewing Company, selling and servicing sewing machines. And uh, that was in 1970 to mid-71 when I got hooked up with my first bank. And I still have people who I sold sewing machines to at that time who call me up and want to know if I uh, will work on their sewing machine. And I tell them, yes, I, I take sewing machine repairs as my therapy away from my volunteer work. Okay, how about the GI Bill? Did you take advantage of any kind of schooling that you could and benefits that you uh, were able to do? I did not but I deal with a lot of students. Uh, I do a lot of volunteer work over at Francis Scott Key High School right now. And I encourage those that are going in the military to take advantage of it. As I look back, I wished I had. Uh, I think I could have advanced my career a little quicker if I had a little more formal education. My education was seat of the pants kind of thing, you know, on the job training. Uh, and I think I did very well. I had a good career as a banker. I was very proud of my accomplishments but I think I could have advanced my career a little quicker and probably made a few extra dollars if I'd have had some formal education behind it. 
but you can't take away that experience. No, and that's everything. No, the experience and common sense, right. and that's something the military will teach you quickly. Absolutely. Uh, common sense, make quick decisions based on the facts in front of you. It paid many a dues in the in the career I, I chose in the in the in the uh, in the banking business. Absolutely, and I'm sure that your career that you had after the military you feel you have to credit that to your experience that you got out of being in the military, oh, your no work ethic. No stuff. question, no Absolutely. question. Oh yeah, the work ethic, my yeah. gosh. Right. Show up for work every day, give an employer eight or more hours a day work that they expect you to have, most definitely. And the discipline, because part of being, I was a lender, a consumer lender mostly in my banking career, but lending the bank's money also carried Every once in a while, there'd be one or two people who might be a little less reluctant or a little less more reluctant to not pay you back. So you wound up being a collector as well. And that's where the discipline really came in. I mean, it was nothing for me to pop up on a guy's front doorstep and knock on his door at 830 at night asking for the bank's money. How about veterans organizations? Have you joined any veterans organization to get your benefits that you deserve? Claims of any kind? I have not uh, filed any VA claims. I, I uh, have friends of mine from the, uh, from the reunions will tell me, uh, uh, look, you've got bad knees. The bad knees started when you were in the Navy. You need to go into VA and do this and that and the other. Well, yeah, I had bad knees from the Navy, but it was playing football for the ship's football team that I had the bad knees. And I don't feel that that was a justifiable. I mean, I've got a lot of friends of mine uh, that I graduated from high school with that were in Vietnam, that are, and in some of the other uh, conflicts, they have justifiable disabilities and they need that VA service. I never felt I was justifiably able or wanting to go into the VA for services because there were more people and it was already a long wait for those guys. I wasn't gonna burden the system with, with what I had. It wasn't, it wasn't military related far as I was concerned. So I didn't really take advantage of any of the VAs. I never joined any of the uh, organizations. Legion. I never joined the American Legion. Uh, didn't really qualify for the VFW because we weren't in a, in a war zone. Uh, as I look back, I wish I had joined the American Legion earlier on in my life, but I got involved in a lot of other volunteer things through my banking career, and it just wasn't time for another organization. I understand that. Uh, is there anything uh, that you would like the, the listeners to, to know about your experience of being in the military that had an impact on your life? There was one incident that I relate to the students at, at Francis Scott Key once they get to know me. There was an incident that occurred and it was a result of the Vietnam conflict. Uh, and it occurred right here in the streets of Westminster. And I was very, it disturbed me for quite a period of time. I was at home on a weekend with my parents. Uh, Barry wasn't home that weekend and I was traveling by bus and my parents were taking me back to the Greyhound bus terminal in Baltimore, but we stopped at, in Westminster for lunch. Gotta have a Harry's hot dog before you leave Westminster. And it, uh, some of those things last you from one week to the next, but had to stop for Harry's lunch. So we stopped, we got our lunch. Major accomplishment, I was in dress whites, never got any chili on the whites. I was good to go. We're walking down the street. My, I was between my mom and dad and a group of students from Western Maryland College were coming up the street. I was in uniform. And as you well know from the Vietnam experience, uh, we were baby killers, we were this, we were that. And uh, they pulled the white hat off my head and spit on me, on my uniform, in my hometown. And that really bothered me. I was able to process it and blame it on the fact they were kids from the college, probably weren't even from Carroll County. So it wasn't a reflection on the county I grew up in or the town I was raised in or the school I graduated from. It was just somebody showing off that didn't know squat and took it out on the uniform, not on me as a person. But it took me a while to process that because that's not something that anybody who grew up in this county would expect to happen to you, even in uniform and even during Vietnam. So I finally processed it and got past it, but it's still there. 
And that leads to another thing. I've been to a lot of veterans meetings. I've been to veterans meetings where you're in attendance. And those of us that were in Vietnam talk about the way we were treated when we came back to our hometown and were in uniform, or we came back through an airport in uniform. Nowadays, it's very gratifying to see the troops get applause, people stand up, they cheer. It wasn't what we saw in the Vietnam era. It was a whole different world. And they were taking it all out on the wrong people. The, the person in uniform, you and I both know. We followed orders, we did what we were told, and we did it to the best of our ability. That's what we were trained for. We didn't make the decisions, we carried them out. Absolutely. It was politics that got involved. And, uh, but many military uh, veterans uh, saw that when they came back. So you're right. So you, oh, it's no question. It's good and, that you got beyond that. And as far as the effect of the Vietnam era, like I say, I graduated from Westminster High School in 1964. And I tell the students at Francis Scott Key when we talk about reunions, and I say, yeah, we do a class reunion every five years. But for some of my classmates, for me to see my classmates, I have to go to Washington and look at the wall. And that's a sombering effect. Absolutely. Amen. I know you've been there many a time. If you've never been to the Vietnam Wall, whether right. you're connected with anybody involved in Vietnam, you really need to. And the World War II Memorial that is down there now is also another great place to go. Uh, I have endearing effect for the World War II because I said my dad was in the Navy during World War II, but his youngest brother was killed uh, on Mount Salerno in Sicily, and I am his namesake. Uh, it's a little strange to go to the World War II monument down in Annapolis with all the uh, p people from the state of Maryland who died in World War II and to see your name etched in a granite monument uh, knowing that it was your uncle that you never met, but it's your name, you know, and it's a little chilling the first time I saw it, but it's an honor to carry on his name and be in the military as he was, uh, did not make the sacrifice he made, but I knew a lot of guys in our graduating class and friends of mine from the neighborhood who are on that wall. And it is the ultimate sacrifice that we as service people made. Well, I want, we want to thank you for your time and coming here and telling your story and your experience that you got out of being a Marine, in the Marine Corps and Navy. Sorry. We understand. You and I know that that's a- Or is that Navy and Marine Corps? Navy and Marine Corps, Corps. absolutely. Yes. Because I was instructed long ago okay. that's right. that if you were on a duty station with a Marine and a, and a sailor and they were equal rank, the sailor had seniority because the Navy was senior to the Marine Corps. Okay, but I'll, I'll I don't believe that. that. <laughs> uh, I believe the, all the Marines I ever served with are just more comrades. That's all it was. It didn't matter. I don't care what branch of service the people were in. They did their service. It can be the Coast Guard. It can be the Marine Corps. It can be Air Force. My minister right now is a 30-year retired Air Force chaplain. Great guy. Great guy. Thank you for your service. We are Appreciate all it. veterans. Absolutely. That's the key fact. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.